and it's a big topic. I have a little disclaimer because I do mention health and I am not a medical practitioner of any kind. I am an architect, as you mentioned. And so it's not intended to treat or diagnose any medical conditions. Um, and I do usually do these for professionals. So um, I always recommend people get an, a professional involved in their project. It's, uh, it's really a complicated topic and it is copyrighted. So it's about 20 minutes when I went through it and I touch on mold background and building science and materials and how that's related. Um, all, as I said, complicated and I'm always trying to figure out how to do this as simply as possible. But my object objectives today in this short time is what is building mold, who is affected and why buildings and why now? Um, this, the rest of this presentation, which you can find through my website, under the education tab is I go into how to identify potential building problems and resources and oftentimes find home building is among my resources. So you guys do a great job. You described me really well, so I don't have to say too much about that. I would like to mention that I have worked for five years for the wood industry as a senior technical director. And um, so my that's where I started teaching actually and teaching my peers, architects, structural engineers and code officials on topics related to wood, structural wood in use in commercial buildings, which is basically the same as, as residential, but a little more complicated. And uh, yeah, so that's, I was in, my specialty was durability, sustainability and fire. And uh, yeah, that's where I kind of, my career morphed for five years and then I um, came out and was gonna do wood consulting and ended up doing, well, actually ended up with a sick family again. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. I am on the Lumber Standards Committee. I am a mom, although my kids are all grown. I have had toxin exposure. And like you, Patrick, I grew up in a basement bedroom. Um, nothing really obvious, but I think in retrospect, it was part of my burden. Uh, I ended up with autoimmune disease and Lyme disease, and as did many others in my family, actually almost all of us. And, uh, and we've recovered our health using natural and non-toxic products. And that's usually what I recommend. But we are all thriving and because of that, uh, I share my story and I share what I can in terms of what I've learned, the mistakes I've made. And, um, and I would say finally, but actually it never really ends. There's always something else around the corner that we're struggling with or, or something new. But my story actually goes back to 2005 when my daughter was 10 and she had full on asthma uh, and inhalers at home and in school. And then why would I think it was my house? You know, I, was an, I inspected it. It looked good. There was no water in the basement, all those things. What I didn't know was that you could have mold in your ductwork. And I found that out at a CEU presentation and then came home and removed the vent cover on our uh, vents or one of our vents. And this is actually it. That's what it looked like. And it's a 1950s house. And that's pretty disgusting. Um, I hired people to fit clean and they turned out to be a scam, threw them out in the middle of their process. Uh, the sec Once I learned who, who to hire and, and figured that out, this is the picture of what was in the ducts after he, they were done cleaning, which is not adequate. It's not clean clearly. And this is another one of my children helping clean. None of this is good. No paper masks, are, are that's not enough. Um, don't have your children do this. It was aspergillus mold everywhere in the dust. And, uh, but my husband was out of town and I didn't know what I was doing. And this is really the beginning of my story. Uh, so we lived and learned and my daughter does not have asthma anymore. It took about a year for her to recover. By 2014, we were doing pretty well. Although my husband and I were now um, having health issues and this is us in a hyperbaric chamber sharing one because it gets very expensive. So here, those are his feet and my head. Um, we did a lot of things to recover our health and spend a lot of money and have done a lot of research. But what was going on with my husband, which you can see in his face, is he had something called autoimmune um, thyroid eye disease and his eyes are looking in different directions. So he actually saw double images everywhere he looked. And we do believe it is related in some way to toxins. It's, there's not a lot of research on this. Um, this was considered incurable. Uh, possibility of surgery, maybe four or five. And then there was also the potential that he wouldn't see at all. 
So we opted not to do that and follow alternative paths. And he is, I'm happy to say, can single vision. He can see like he used to see. And he runs in races. And this is, I think, a 10K or something that I walked in. And, and he's doing great. It took about five years. But I, I share this because recovery is possible. And I want to inspire people to not give up and to, to have hope. And my family has certainly recovered from more. This is other things, autoimmune diseases that were considered permanent that we have recovered from. And, um, but the building and the environment is really a big piece. And so that brings us to what is building mold. And um, the terms usually used are fungus or mildew. Mildew is mold. So don't let anybody tell you that. No, it's just mildew. <laughs> Uh, it is mold. It's neither a plant or an animal. They have defined cell walls. They lack chlorophyll, so they are not something that's going to grow in sun. In fact, they like no sun and no light. They reproduce by means of spores. There's more than 100,000 species. In fact, some research has suggested over 6,000 or 6 million, actually, not 6,000, 6 and 5 to 6 million species. And they feed on dead organic matter. And that's really important because we do have mold everywhere and that's a good thing. It's really nature's recycling system. And so we don't wanna eliminate mold from the environment but we don't want it in our buildings by any means. So the conditions for mold growth are really important to understand to figure out like, well, how are we gonna stop it? Uh, mold requires, has spores. And as I said, that's everywhere. Uh, they re mold requires oxygen. Again, that's going to be anywhere we're going to be. A temperature of 30 to 130. Again, pretty much where we're going to be. And a nutrient source and moisture itself is required for mold. So those two bottom ones are what we're going to come back to. So is mold toxic? I get this question a lot. And I get people who think it's not because they, don't, they feel fine. I can tell you that my husband felt fine when my daughter was affected in 2005 and he didn't feel fine in 2014. So we don't always know what the long-term repercussions are. There are some species that are common in buildings. These are some of them, Cladosporium, Penicillium, Fusarium, Aspergillus, Stachybotrys, just to tell you how those are pronounced. And there's many, many more. Uh, as I said, more than 100,000 species. We typically in screening tests are, are, are testing for less than 40. So sometimes in a screening test, it comes back, oh, wow, they didn't find anything. Well, that doesn't mean it's not there. It's just they didn't find anything that on that day at that time, the way it was tested, and possibly because there's some species of mold out there that haven't even been identified yet that may well be toxic. So it's a complicated and there's a lot more research needed. An awareness is starting. California and many other states are starting to publish through their public health departments documentation where this is a quote out of this one. Um, basically that the presence of water damage, dampness, visible mold, or even mold odor is enough to tell us that in, that indoor environment is unhealthy, very likely unhealthy. And so if you see mold, there's no reason, in my opinion, there's no reason to go out and get it tested, even though sometimes it's nice to know what species you have. The bottom line is you may have more species anyway, and it doesn't matter. It's all going to be treated the same way. Uh, and stopping the water is going to be a big, big part of that. Some of the symptoms are really ubiquitous and also common, so common that you don't even recognize that they're connected to your building. And that was certainly the case with my family. In fact, I would say today, I, I have four children that I raised, and I, I only thought my daughter was affected at the time. In retrospect, I would say they were all affected because when I look at this list, there was other things that started happening in our family that I didn't think was related to our building. So things like headaches, sinus infections, anxiety and depression, memory loss, brain fog, uh, immune system dysfunctions, imbalances, fat just fatigue, uh, and there's GI problems, shortness of breath, rashes are really common, uh, bloody noses, joint pain, visual disturbances. And then there's a relationship that's documented in a lot of medical literature. When you look at autoimmune diseases, there, there's an environmental factor that's probably contributing. If nothing else, it's a burden on the immune system that allows these other things 
to um, take hold in a bigger way. So things like fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. I had lupus and I had Sjogren's uh, syndrome and I do not have those anymore. Um, I, don't have my, I don't have the signs of them. Uh, Graves disease is what my husband also had. Rheumatoid arthritis is another one. Uh, people who have trouble with insomnia, um, which is the opposite of the anxiety piece, but they can't sleep and they're falling asleep during the day. And um, so there's all, all these things that seem like really prevalent. And so how many of the people suffering for those things have an impact of their buildings that they live in? I wonder. I know the um, asthma was what my daughter had and she does not have asthma anymore. She didn't a year after we figured it out. So I just wonder, you know, and so it's good to think about. Interestingly enough, autoimmune disease affects women more than men. And it, it seems to be in just really not scientific way that my clients are more women than men that are affected by the mold. Although there are a lot of men that are affected and often very seriously. So who is affected? Uh, and I like to look at the stories of when we had a canary in a coal mine. So the coal miners would take this little bird, very fragile and sensitive little bird down into the coal mine. And if the fumes in the coal mine got bad enough that this very sensitive bird would die, then they would know that they needed to get out because they would be next. So the, the canary was a warning sign to the stronger, pe the stronger people, the miners. And today we have mold in our buildings that's affecting some people. And I believe that those people are the canaries. They're, we should be paying attention to that because they may be lucky because they know they need to get out. Whereas some other people may just say, oh, I'm just going to stay. And then they may have much worse uh, issues and people are dying. They're dying of mold exposure. And they're having very, very serious illnesses because of mold exposure. So uh, who, you know, there's some documentation that says it's 25% of the population. I would say that's probably the minimum, but if we just look at what 25% would be in a state like California, uh, that's a million people. And if you, count, if you multiply that over how many people are in the United States, it's more than 80 million people. So this is, not an insignificant number of people who are affected at that bare minimum number. I would say that my whole family was affected 100%. So I'm not sure that the 25% is, is right, but um, maybe it's 50%. We don't actually know because those symptoms are ubiquitous and very common. And we don't know how many of them are affected by buildings because often mold is concealed, completely concealed. So why buildings and why now? Well, I believe it's an unintended consequence of the sustainability mm -hmm. movement. Uh, obviously the sustainability movement's a good thing. We wanna have uh, energy savings and, and tight buildings and low energy costs and all those things. But in the process, we've created a monster which is with a lot of sick buildings and, and poor air quality. And it's all expensive. It's all expensive to figure out. And so um, I welcome the discussion here and anywhere. Um, I think it's great that we're talking about it. The moisture sources are really critical because as I mentioned, that's a big deal on mold is you gotta have moisture. You can't, you're not gonna have mold without moisture. Even, even um, say a dry rot actually has a moisture component. It's a misnomer. In the interior, some of our moisture sources are the people that live there. And it's the things that we do as occupants. You know? So we, maybe we dance and sing and, and run around, kids run around, we cook. We take showers. Um, on the exterior, we have rain, which is kind of an obvious one, but we have irrigation systems often running at night that nobody looks at, um, watering our buildings in addition to the grass, groundwater seeping up and wicking against gravity into our buildings, water vapor condensing and creating bulk water uh, in cavities. And then one that often gets overlooked is the moisture sources that are coming from construction itself. So um, there's water, we're pouring concrete, it's liquid. It has to dry for actually years, it's gonna keep drying. Um, things like, like drywall work and painting and there's a lot of other um, processes, even some kinds of insulation add moisture to the building itself. Rain on the construction site. I have people with brand new homes that in a year or less 
maybe two years are full of mold. And some of them irrecoverable, it's everywhere. So that usually has a construction source. Um, on the exterior, we obviously have port site, site drainage, flooding, dampness, gutters and downspouts can, they're good, but they can be done incorrectly or poorly. Lack of gutters can be a problem, even in the desert. Uh, faulty construction, so I think it's great to always be talking about best practices. Leaky roofs, a lot of some of this is maintenance, leaking walls, air leakage. Like I said, sprinklers hitting buildings. If there's one thing that I would say everybody can go home and check is inspect your home, your school, your workplace, and look and see what kind of signs you see. In this picture, you can actually see signs of the downspout um, not working properly, and you can see this stain here. So those are the kinds of things that I point out to people is um, how to look at buildings, because we can all do this. Everyone can do this. You don't need my background. Uh, plumbing leaks is an obvious one that is easier to find. Overflowing the toilet, the tub, uh, the sink, the sewer is overflowing. Those are all easier. Humidification can be a problem. People adding humidity, um, having high humidity and not realizing the causes. Sometimes it could be drying six people's towels in one tiny bathroom uh, or hanging clothes to dry in a basement. Maybe that's not a good idea at certain times of the year in certain climates. Steam from cooking showers, we talked about condensation. Exhaust fan errors is another big one. Uh, bathroom fans, some people don't have them at all or they're incorrectly done, incorrectly vented. Dryer vents, kitchen exhausts, whether they exist or, or, or are just done incorrectly. Uh, this picture is actually showing an attic shot of the mold growing on the roof deck that's being sucked in from the soffit. The soffits are where we draw air into the attic. So to be exhausting our bathroom moisture out a soffit vent is spitting in the wind and it's turning around and coming right back in through the adjacent vent. And it shows up after five or seven years or more. So it's not something that we're usually finding right away. And, and usually the people building these are not realizing that it's a problem because they don't get to see it. Heating, air conditioning and ventilation flaws. And of course people, um, so we're all contributing. In terms of what building science is, and I'm sure you guys talk about this kind of stuff all the time. For my definition, it's about the materials, but it's also about the envelope and the enclosure and the assembly of those materials, which gets a little more complicated. And then it's about the systems. So that includes the, the ducts and the um, vents and the plumbing and the electric system. So all those things coming together to, for me is really what building science is all about. And let's bring that back to mold growth in buildings. We talked about the things we can't change. And we talk a lot about nutrient sources and I see a lot of materials that are, oh, we're, this material is mold resistant. Um, but the one thing that we really absolutely have to control is moisture regardless of the material. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that because as you heard my story, we had mold on metal ducts. Okay, well, so how did we do that? Metal doesn't actually, it's not a food source. Um, this picture on the right is mold growing on a, on a roof deck, a commercial building, the metal roof deck, and it's mold growing up there. So you always have to ask like, oh, wait, what's the food source? And this was surprising to me. Um, and what's the what's this? the the food source is dirt and dust. It's everywhere. We don't live in our environment without some dirt and dust. It's everywhere. And the moisture is coming from condensation on a cold metal surface. So there we go. Now we got mold on materials we don't think of. So no material is immune from moisture. So it would obviously decays, but steel studs corrode and concrete spalls and then the rebar rusts and degrades. And then masonry does the same thing. It absorbs the water and then this black is pretty nasty and then that turns to dust um, over time. And stucco doesn't like to move either. So, so also know that no building material is exempt from mold. This is a solid masonry wall with mold growing on it. Here we have concrete block with mold growing on it. A water supply metal to the toilet tank with mold growing on it. And we have steel stud wall with uh, sheathing, Egyptian sheathing with mold growing on it. Wood obviously grows mold as well. Could be any, many different colors. 
and smells and all, and you cannot see it at all. So there's a building safe and resilient is my goal. We have choices to make. I'm always trying to figure out what the right way is. And for that reason, I am a perpetual student and happy to be here. So a little bit more, this is my website. So you can find under the education tab that rest of that program and, and other things. My blog posts are free. I have videos on YouTube also. Cheryl Seco Architect is the place for that. I have a Build a Safe Home course for um, homeowners and builders. Architects have been in there. It's a six week course. You could do it faster or slower. Uh, I do come on monthly and do live Q and A's on that. And we discuss all kinds of individual details, but it's, it's everything that I've been talking about with my clients in, in a high level um, for people to get started at a very affordable rate. And they have other programs that you can find, including the one that I just talked about. Moisture Basics is another one that is a mini course for you, you to get started on and uh, for people to get started on and really trying to get to the root causes, which is my goal is getting to the root cause and figuring out uh, how to solve this stuff. So you can, I do have a free mold kit that people can download through my website, avoidingmold.com. My name, my last name is Seiko, Cheryl Seiko, and that's not a stage name. So if you can't remember that, go to avoidingmold.com. If you put in Cheryl Architect Mold, you'll probably find me on YouTube. 